I would like to begin, and I'm not quite sure how long it will go, a series of lessons dealing with Jesus' law of marriage and divorce. And the reason I say I'm not quite sure how long it will go is that before we get through, I want to deal with all that I presently know, and there may be some I don't know, of error that has been taught over the last 40 years trying to get out from under our Lord's teaching on marriage, divorce, and remarriage. I first of all want to point out that we will not be studying all the Old Testament has to say on the matter. I know that's a good study, and we could do that. But we are under the authority of Jesus Christ and the words of the New Testament rightly divided. And we want to be sure we know His will. We don't approach God today under anything in the Old Testament. We approach Him under the teaching of the New Testament. We recognize that the home is the basic unit of society. And I know of nothing else that has come under fire more than marriage and the home. We realize that a great many people are living as husband and wife without being actually joined together by God. They're not in the Matthew chapter 19, verse 6, God join undefiled bed marriage. They're simply living in a state of fornication. We also recognize that when it comes to homes, many of them, while they're in marriage, as far as civil law is concerned, they are not qualified, and we'll understand hopefully this better, by the New Testament to ever have entered into a Matthew 19, verse 6 marriage. So the home is simply in a mess. There are a great many single parent homes. All sorts of things are done to undermine the home. And this has been going on now for many, many years. So now we're seeing those reared in homes of that kind, if they may be called homes, grown up and uh, engaged in something called marriage, and maybe even in a second generation of people who have no knowledge whatsoever, well, first of all, of God or the Bible, and certainly not what the Bible has to say, specifically the New Testament, Jesus is teaching concerning marriage and divorce or remarriage. When that kind of thing happens, brethren, you can expect a nation, its schools, and all other institutions, government, to begin to fall apart. For those of you who've lived on this earth for a while, look at how things are now, in general, from what they were quite a few years ago. Now, I'm not saying that quite a few years ago, everybody was what they ought to be. That's not the point at all. It never has been that way. But there has been a far greater inclination many years ago to be in harmony with the biblical teachings regarding morality, and marriage, divorce, and remarriage, and the home. There was greater respect for the role of the man, of the husband, of the father, and the woman, wife, and mother. We're not only seeing these things attacked, but now there's gender reassignment and all such stuff as that. Uh, people loose themselves from God. There is no end to where they will at least attempt to go in their thinking and their actions. In my 50-some-odd years of preaching, starting back in the 60s and then even into the 70s, I never could foresee it getting to where it has finally gotten. I remember well when we began to battle in the mid-70s, roughly, the errors that begin to justify men and women who are not qualified by the New Testament to marry, and yet they were. They were entering into marriages contrary to the teaching of Jesus, and that was bad enough. Well, see, in the last 40 years, it's gotten even worse. 
People just don't think about God. They don't think about Him with authority over their lives. They don't think about being obligated to Him in any form or fashion. And it's reflected very well in the homes. And the Lord's church and the people that make it up being in the world are too many times impacted, even though they in words say, we'll pose that. By their conduct, they show the world is filtered in. And they reject the teaching of the Bible, though they may not say they are, concerning what it has to teach on marriage and the home and the roles of everybody in it. When you seek to carry the gospel to this world, and you want to do all you can to convert people to Christ, you must be aware that people are in all kinds of messes regarding marriage, divorce, and remarriage. And you can't just say, well, let's just get them baptized and everything's all right. No, they've got to repent. Baptism is not worth one thing as far as forgiving sins unless people repent of all their sins that they've committed. And a lot of those sins have to do with marriage, divorce, and remarriage. Well, that means then somebody's got to cease existing in a sinful life. And there's where the problem is. And that's why a great many in the church have even come up with false doctrines to try to justify people who have no biblical authority to be in a Matthew chapter 19, verse 6 marriage. So we're not going to spend time on what the law of Moses had to teach on it. We realize it's been nailed to the cross, Colossians 2.14. And just a casual reading of the book of Hebrews shows the difference in the New Testament of Jesus Christ and in the Old Testament, and that we are to approach God today through the New Testament. Hebrews 7.12 and chapter 8, verses 6 through 13. And as I say, the whole book emphasizes that very point. It doesn't mean the Old Testament's worthless. It just simply means it's not the way God sets forth His authority for people to live by today. So to learn our duty now, we must, it's imperative, there's no getting around it if heaven's to be our home, go to the New Testament, to the teaching of inspiration, Acts 3, 22 and 23. Therein does our Lord reveal His will on everything. Somebody says, what does the Lord think about it? Read the New Testament of Jesus Christ, the last will and testament of Jesus Christ. You will know what He thinks about it if you will put forth the necessary honest effort to learn how to rightly divide the word of truth with a willingness to change your life wherever you find yourself out of harmony with it. Now, if you don't have a desire to sacrifice even your very life to be in compliance with the will of the Lord, then you won't get much out of it. But if your will is to do His will above and beyond all things on this earth, then you'll begin to understand some things. Now there are four principal passages in the New Testament where Jesus is teaching on this subject of marriage, divorce, and remarriage are set out. And these are, you might want to jot them down, Matthew 5, verses 31 and 32, chapter 19, 3 through 12, Mark chapter 10, verses 2 through 12, and Luke chapter 16, verse 18. Now in Matthew chapter 19, verses 3 through 12, and Mark chapter 10, verses 2 through 12, you'll find that they are parallel passages. Mark and Luke simply state God's general law of marriage. They don't give the one exception which allows divorce with a right to remarry. Only Matthew does that. Only Matthew does that. Now, it's important to understand that you must, as we've said countless times, take the totality of what the Bible says on the subject before you begin to conclude what it means. If you just take Mark 10, 2 through 12, you will say there is no exception because Mark does not include the exception. But may I remind you that he who made the law 
and also make the exception. And when you take all of what Jesus said here in these passages, you not only find the law governing these things, but you find Jesus giving one exception. So let's keep those points in mind as we go through some of these particular matters. In Matthew 5, 31 32, you'll see that that is in what we know as a, well, it's a part of the Sermon on the Mount. And immediately before stating verses 31 and 32, Jesus reminded his hearers of the seventh of the ten commandments. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Verses 27 through 30. Exodus chapter 20 and verse 14. Remember, it's in Exodus 19 and 20 where you have the beginning of the Mosaical system and the end of patriarchy as far as the Jews are concerned. Jesus forbade not only the act of adultery, but the lustful look which would lead to it. Now let me pause here and say the lustful look does not constitute adultery, but there won't be any adultery unless there's a lustful look. <laughs> it all begins in the mind. The whole business of serving God begins in the inward man. It begins in the mind. It is the spirit or the inward man where the thinking and the purposes, the motives are done. If you can win the battle of the human will by winning the mind, then you've got the battle won. You'll control yourself. And how much does the New Testament talk about being sober and self-controlled? When uh, Paul preached to Felix, he preached of, of temperance. Well, that means self-control. And so self-control is important. And it certainly is when it comes to the matter of committing fornication or engaging in adultery, which means that one person in a fornicating situation had to be in a married situation. Listen to what he stated. It hath been said... Whosoever shall put away his wife, let him give her a writing of divorcement. This is Jesus speaking. But I say unto you, that whosoever shall put away his wife, saving for the cause of fornication, causeth her to commit adultery. And whosoever shall marry her that is divorced, committeth adultery. Again, that's Matthew 5, 31 and 32. In verse 31. Jesus was clearly referring to the inspired Moses writing in Deuteronomy 24, verses 1 through 3. But in clear contrast to that which God through Moses permitted, or we may better say allowed for Israel, Jesus as deity, the only begotten Son of the living God, boldly says, but I say unto you, there's only one cause for divorce. Our Lord says, that is the cause of fornication. Now, one may put away his wife, or conversely, a woman may put away her husband, if he or she commits pornea. That's the Greek word. That's the word that the Holy Spirit had the inspired writer use here. It means any illicit sexual relations outside of the bounds of a Matthew 19, 6, God join undefiled bed marriage. So we need to know that. If we're going to have things as God wants it, now understand, if you want to do what you please without any restraints, then just forget all this. Be a man or be a woman and go on straight to hell as one of them. But if you are determined to please your God, if you are determined to live in such a way as you can hear your Lord say at the day of judgment, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Enter ye into the joys of thy Lord. Then you're going to be concerned about these things. 
You're going to be concerned about them for yourself, for your spouse, for your children, for your family, for the Lord's church and all members thereof. Our Lord gives no other cause for divorce. The right of the innocent party to remarry isn't mentioned in this particular passage. But Jesus does state that whosoever, whosoever is as broad as the human race, whosoever shall marry her that is divorced committeth adultery. Now one becomes an adulterer if he marries one who is guilty of adultery. So you can see that it's involved in this. Because one becomes an adulterer, that is, they had to adulterate. You know, if, you, if this is the purest water that's possible, at least half of this uh, bottle is full of water, if that's the purest water possible, to adulterate it is to add something to it other than the pure water that's in it, and it corrupts it. Doesn't mean it poisons it. It might be Kool-Aid and you can drink it. But it's not pure water anymore. It's adulterated. So the very fact that he says, whosoever shall marry her that is divorced committed adultery implies then that somebody's getting into something called marriage they're not authorized to get into. It's called adultery. Now the pivotal passage in the New Testament on Jesus' law of marriage, divorce and remarriage, is Matthew chapter 19, verses 3 through 12. I think here we find in one place the fullest statement of his law on this subject. The Pharisees, and Jeff's done a great job setting out really what they were and how they thought in lessons in auditorium class. Uh, an arrogant, legalistic, religious bunch among the Jews are the ones who come to Jesus and they have a question. You know, if you were a righteous person, as the Bible defines righteousness, and you saw the Pharisees coming to deal with you, you would automatically have your defenses up because it would be no good thing in most cases. It would be in so many cases by the very characters and the fruit they bore out in those characters that they're going to try to slap you down because you've done something they didn't like. It wasn't a matter of what did God teach, and they're trying to get you to do it. It's a matter of you're not doing what we don't like. Now, I've, over the years in preaching the gospel, had people take that same view when you preach the gospel because that's the way they viewed anything the preacher said. That's just what he said. You could just quote the Bible to them, but because you stood behind the pulpit and preached it, then they'd say, well, that's just what Brother Brown said. Well, that's a wrong attitude on their part. But the Pharisees were people who had their own laws. And I won't go back into what Jeff so well set out some time ago regarding how it is that they uh, taught for doctrines the commandments of men. And by their traditions, they set aside the law of Moses. They weren't seeking the truth. They were tempting Jesus. They were jealous of his influence with the people. They sought to tie him up, involve him in an emotional debate among the Jews. It was an ongoing discourse of his day. Since feelings ran high on the issue, as they do in cases like this, and the people were clearly divided, their idea was whichever side of the issue Jesus took, would alienate him from some of his followers and help us in our desires to fix his wagon, as we used to say. The Pharisees then come up with this question. Remember, they're not asking the Lord God Almighty, God in the flesh, the Messiah, what is God's will? We want to do it. They're tempting him. There's no honest bone about them. They don't want to say, Speak, Lord, thy servant, hear the command, and I will obey. They're trying to ruin him. So they say, is it lawful for a man to put away his wife for every cause? Now some notable rabbi said, yes. Others interpreted Deuteronomy chapter 24 
to allow divorce only in the case of sexual unfaithfulness. Now, interestingly, Jesus did not come down on either side. Notice what he did. He rebukes them, really, by his answer. And notice he doesn't tell them outright, explicitly, the answer to the question. If you'll study the method of Jesus, you'll learn some great methods for yourself. Have you noticed that when anybody asks you a question, they are authorizing you to ask them a question? And what does Jesus do? Have ye not read? Who are these people? We know the law. We know how to tell everybody else how to live by the law, even though they didn't. Do you realize what a slap in the face it was for him to say, haven't you read this in your Bibles? They're the ones that are supposed to ask that question. He asked if they had just read the Bible. Then what? They know the answer. Isn't that interesting? So many times... If we would just read the Bible, we would have the answer. And they would have too. They'd be able to answer their own question. Now that's something Jesus did a lot of times. I believe Jeff brought that out this morning in some of his teaching in class. How that many times that Jesus would just come out and say, well here's the answer. He'd ask a question that would make them go down into the depths of their being and cause them to have to come up with the answer. In their own mind. He said, he which made them at the beginning made them male and female. Well, that seems to be a problem among a lot of people today. They can't figure out a boy from a girl. And this reminds me of what Paul said about a lot of people ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. They get themselves so wrapped up in a prejudiced, biased view that just must be upheld at all costs, they can't tell the difference in a boy and a girl. Now, I tell you how messed up people can be? And that's where we are, folks. That's exactly where we are in this country and in a lot of religious situations. But our Lord knew how to get to it. And here are these people saying, well, we're God's people. We know the Bible. And Jesus says, but if you know the Bible, haven't you read this? And what did he say in the beginning? Well, he made them at the beginning male and female. Homosexuality and so-called homosexual marriages are condemned by this very statement without any other in the Bible. Because he's talking about in the context. He's talking about marriage. God made male and female for marriage. The practice of two persons of the same sex cohabiting together is nothing but a perverse action. It's a perversion. In fact, it's an unnatural perversion of God's purpose in marriage and is by these words condemned. Just add Romans 1, 26 and 27, 1 Corinthians 6, 9 through 11. They're just additions to this. But you've got all you need right here. Now, if a person denies the existence of God, the deity of Christ, the inspiration of the Bible, then you have to deal with those things. But for the person to say that the Bible is the Word of God, but I can't tell the difference in little girls and little boys. Or I don't know who it is that can contract a Matthew 19, 6 marriage. Have you not read? That would straighten it up. Jesus Next, simply noted Genesis chapter 2 and verse 24. For this cause shall a man leave father and mother and shall cleave to his wife, and they twain, that is two people, shall be one flesh. Now, I want you to notice something. If you go to Genesis 2 and verse 24, you'll note the word two does not occur. Jesus as the Son of God who has all power or authority in heaven and in earth, Matthew 28, 18, added this word to strengthen the idea that only two, one man and one woman, make a marriage. Well, you see, he's God, and if he wants to add the word, then he can add the word. 
Just like if he gives the rule on something, he can give the exception. He is the legislator. And I might say this about anything the Bible teaches. It's obligatory on us today regarding our salvation. The Lord has always taken a dim, dim view of those people who would legislate for him. He's always made it clear, don't add to or take away from my word. You do only what I tell you to do. We say it this way, I do at least. Do what he said in the way he said it for the reason, or if he has more than one reason that he said do it. We always are interested in a command being fully obeyed. And that's one, reason, one way that we can determine that we have obeyed his commandments, seeing that the whole duty of man is to fear God and keep his commandments. Well, having stated that in marriage two shall be one flesh, Jesus concludes, and notice he does what we've said most often here in our teaching, he begins by saying, wherefore. That is a conclusion. When you see hints, therefore, so, or wherefore, that means I've given you the facts that are necessary. Now reason with them, here is our divine conclusion. Wherefore, they are no more twain or two, but one flesh. What therefore, another conclusion based on a conclusion. God hath joined together. Let not man put asunder. I'm concerned about who God joins together to be husband and wife. When a man and a woman who are eligible in the sight of God to marry commit themselves to each other in harmony with the laws of God and His purpose for marriage and wherein the laws of the land govern such, Romans chapter 13, they are thereby joined together by God in that union. Now exactly when is that? At what moment? You know, somebody says, at what moment does a man have his sins washed away? Well, it's when the believing, repentant person who's confessed his faith in Christ is baptized. He's raised to what? Walk in the newness of life. So it's at baptism when he gets his sins washed away. Well, exactly when is a man joined together by God to a woman, both being eligible to be husband and wife, when are they actually husband and wife? I like what a preacher said one time. He said, when I say they're husband and wife. <laughs> well, there is a point to that. Because every way you study it, any place you want to, in Old or New Testaments, you will find the general rule that when a man and a woman who are eligible for God to become husband and wife hold themselves forth at a given point to be from henceforth husband and wife, then they are. Now, there's different ways people have done that over the years. There's different laws that require that. Since I got married, the laws of uh, at that time, we were married in Tennessee, uh, they've changed. They've changed in about every state. They were different in Tennessee than they were in Arkansas. But Romans 13 says, I'm to obey the law of the land when they don't violate God's law by me obeying the law of the land. So then that's what I would do. And you had to have witnesses, two witnesses, sign on your marriage license in Tennessee. So when that was done and we held ourselves out publicly to be husband and wife and we were, and now I pronounce you husband and wife, I firmly believe in the mind of God. He joined us together to be just exactly that, being that we were eligible to become so, desire it, and set up a point that from this point forward we shall be by joining hands, putting rings on fingers, the I wills and the I do's, just make it more formal and more solemn. So that could change. You know, we joke about it. Maybe some don't know this about history since they know very little about history. But on the wagon trains when they were in the territories and there was no state government, some couple wanted to get married, they jumped over a broomstick. 
Well, on one side of the broomstick, they weren't husband and wife. When they landed on the other side, they were. That suits me fine. I don't care how it is, as long as the thing itself doesn't violate God's will, that you hold yourself out at this point before the world to be husband and wife. You are, and God joins you together as such. So there shouldn't be any upsetting thing over the ceremony. Man at great peril presumptuously separates that which God himself has joined together. And that ought to set forth even further why we're engaged in this study. Though it's been discussed the last 40-something years over and over again and every way possible, it seems that we still tend to forget that. I'm not so sure right now the state of this country, it's more important to study these things today than it was 15 years ago or 40 years ago when we were having most of that study going on, most of the debates taking place. Just look what a mess marriage in the home is in today, or even the attitude toward God in the Bible concerning marriage and divorce and remarriage. This, what I've said so far today, is, is so strange to people, they have no idea. They, they would be amazed at what's been said so far, because you do your own thing. And we've had about three generations now grow up since the 60s of doing their own thing. So who are you to try to do this kind of thing? Besides that, if you get rid of God, you can do what you want to do anyway. Because what I'm teaching is from God. And if you don't believe in God, then do whatever it is you want to do, as long as you're big enough to get by with it. Now, the Pharisees were unhappy, to say the least, with Jesus' plain declaration of God's original purpose and plan for marriage. And like many people today, they were looking for a loophole. They thought they'd found it in Deuteronomy chapter 24, verses 1 through 4. They respond to our Lord by saying, well, if it's the case that God intends one man and one woman to live together for life, then help comes this question. Why did Moses then command to give a writing of divorcement and to put her away? That was their inquiry. You know, it's always surprising. Well, not surprised. It is surprising, but after reading it over the years, it doesn't surprise me anymore. You'd think they would learn about this business of asking Jesus questions. But I don't know that they ever fully got it. But every time they asked questions like this, it was like they shot themselves in the head with a forty-five caliber pistol, and they just didn't realize they'd already blown their brains out a while ago. Why try this one? Jesus replied, look how it all comes back to haunt them and lay it on their shoulders. Jesus replied, Moses, now can you, can you picture their faces in view of where they are right now in this discussion? Moses, and Jesus looking right at them, because of the hardness of your hearts, suffered you to put away your wives. And then he says, but from the beginning it was not so. Now how would you answer him when you heard that? In view of this whole, think of the whole situation. God's original purpose in marriage is for a permanent union between a husband and his wife. Only the hardness of man, men's hearts caused God for a period of time to permit an exception to this, and it was under the law of Moses for the Jews. The late brother H. Leo Bowles commented on Matthew 19, verses 7 and 8 as follows. I'm quoting Brother Bowles. I think he passed away in 1946. Jesus reminded them that it was not a command, but a sufferance. God saw fit to grant this latitude through Moses to the Jews, but only to allow it. The right and strict law, such as had been in the beginning while Adam and Eve were in the state of innocence, would now be restored in the kingdom which Christ came to establish. The privilege of the law of Moses shows the degeneracy of mankind and that the strictest penalties which human laws can inflict are necessary to prevent the evils which the wicked passions of men would otherwise produce. Page 388 in his comments on this matter. Now, think about that for a minute. What is the source of all evil in this world? Well, you can say the devil. 
The devil doesn't stand a chance where men won't believe his lies. So who's the problem? Men. Men leaving God. Again, man's attitude toward God vis-a-vis -vis Cain. People get all upset about, well, what kind of offering did Cain offer? Was it right or it wrong? Well, it was wrong, but look at the attitude of Cain. That's where the problem was. Cain would have never made an offering that was wrong if his attitude toward God wasn't wrong. That's where the problem was. Abel didn't have that attitude. Abel did exactly what he was told to do because his attitude toward God was to speak, Lord, thy servant heareth command, and I will obey. Not Cain. And so there's always been people like that in the world. And so it is toward such a thing as marriage, divorce, and remarriage. To God's original plan of marriage, now restored by Jesus as his plan for all mankind in the Christian age, Jesus gave one and only one exception. Only one. And I say unto you, whosoever shall put away his wife, except it be for fornication, and shall marry another, committeth adultery. And whoso marrieth her which is put away, committeth adultery. Matthew 19, 9. People have tried so much to get around the simplicity of this to do as they please, they make it hard to understand. But it's not hard to understand. What I found interesting over the years is when you have people who are not members of the church and not familiar with the Bible, but they can read and understand. They manage in their lives to read and understand documents. Give it to them and ask them to read it closely and ask them to explain what it means. And they'll get it right most of the time. But my brethren, like the Pharisees of old who know that book, but they're trying to justify family members, children, mom and daddy. Some reason or another, they can't get it. It's plain in this passage what the matter is. And one would think that there would be no misunderstanding of it. But it is, without doubt, a very controversial passage when it comes to this subject of marriage. Uh, a, a veteran gospel preacher of years ago was once asked to explain Matthew 19 in verse 9. And he replied curtly, Matthew 19, 9 doesn't need explaining. It needs obeying. And that's where a lot of the problem is. A whole lot of the problem of understanding the Scripture is people aren't willing to obey it. They understand it. They won't do what it says. And when you start that process, you blind yourself to what it means. That's how you blind yourself. That's how you deceive yourself. Yes, I understand it. That's not what I want. And so you partake of the tree in the garden, which God told you not to. That's how it works. So the controversy comes not because the Lord's teaching is complex or obscure, but because some don't want to accept it as it stands and therefore seek ways to get around his teaching. But that's been true, hasn't it, all through accounts of the Bible with people that didn't want to serve God? Serving God means doing what God says. You're not a servant of God without obeying God. The general rule of marriage and divorce is Whosoever shall put away his wife and shall marry another committeth adultery. There's the general rule. This is essentially the way the rule is stated. Uh, basically, Mark, Mark 10 and 11, and Luke 16 18. Because the exception clause is not included there. But I say again to the general rule, Jesus added one exception. He said, except it be for fornication. The force of that acceptive clause is this. If and only if fornication is present. That's the force of an acceptive clause. If one divorces his marriage partner, spouse, and marries another person, that person is guilty of adultery with but one exception. If the reason for his divorcing his marriage partner is that his partner has had um, illicit sexual relations, that's fornication, as I said, from the Greek word pornea, covers also homosexual relations, even bestiality with someone else or something else, then that person can remarry without sin. 
It's implied that the one doing the putting away is himself or herself, as the case may be, innocent of having illicit sexual relations. In such a case, one is not committing adultery when he divorces his partner who is guilty of fornication and then remarries somebody else that is eligible for marriage. Now, please note that the privilege of putting away a partner or a spouse is given to the one whose spouse has committed fornication. Uh, I can't emphasize it enough, enough. Such a person doesn't incur sin if he remarries. He's innocent. It's the idea of being innocent. And this privilege is not given to the guilty party. Therefore, the guilty party, the one that is put away for fornication, is not given the right to contract another marriage without entering into sin. Our Lord also added, Whoso marrieth her which is put away doth commit adultery. Now under the law of Moses, one who was divorced for the unseemly thing or uncleanness could marry someone else, Deuteronomy 24, 2, but not so according to our Lord's teaching. We started out with Matthew 5, 32 and Matthew 19, 9 and also Luke 16, 18. Every one of them teach that one who has put away, been put away, one who has been put away, cannot remarry without sin. And the one who would marry a put-away person is guilty of sin. These things are so important, and yet I think it's got to the point in our country where the truth has been neglected so long they sound mean, ugly, and hateful and unloving. Because we've been fed this devil's baloney so long that you're trying to withhold from me something good for me. Sounds like the devil to Eve in the garden, doesn't it? You're trying to judge me. You know, God's already judged. I like what old brother Marshall Keeble said. said, I'm just a fruit inspector. By their fruit you shall know them. When somebody explains that they're in a condition that is not authorized by the teaching of the Bible... I can tell it. Somebody says, I'm a Christian. You ever been immersed by the authority of Christ for the remission of sins? No. Then you're not a Christian. And I'm not mean, hateful, and unloving for saying you're not a Christian. Any more than Jesus was, you surely wouldn't criticize him, when he told the woman at the well, who was a Samaritan, that salvation is of the Jews. Ye worship, ye know not what. We know what we worship. Now, wasn't that hateful of him? So, couldn't he have said it nice in another way? Truth is truth. There always will be truth, regardless of what men say about it, what they think about it, or whatever. It's just the way that it is. And we're to preach the truth. And the truth of salvation in Christ is set out as clearly as the truth about marriage, divorce, remarriage. Now, the Lord willing, in the coming weeks, however long it takes, I want to consider all of the attempts that modern day, I think they're more Sadducees than Pharisees, and modern day people have tried to set apart what we studied today, try to set, get around it. And you know, most of these have come from members of the church who claim they do God's service. I have to ask myself the question, am I honest with God and with myself and with the Bible? And then ask yourself the question, did this preacher here this afternoon preach to you the truth of God or did he preach some concoction that is not found in the Bible? Well, you see, it's up to you to study, personally to know. And then, of course, if you love me, you're duty-bound to God and my soul to show me. I'll close by telling you a little story. I preached a whole series of lessons many, many years ago on a radio program on uh, the Holy Spirit, and it got into the Pentecostal claims and miracles and the design, purpose, and end of miracles. And I did the program live, and it was every day from 11.30 to 11.45. So I had a good listening audience. I got back to the office in a few minutes because we weren't far from the studio, and the phone was ringing when I got into the office. 
I answered it, and it was an elderly woman on the other end of the line. She was, to say the least, outraged at what I had preached about the end of miracles and what the Bible taught about the baptism of the Holy Spirit and that it did not exist today. And I began to try to reason with her, and you know, there's a big mistake you make. If, have you ever tried to reason with unreasonable people? Don't try. You'll, you'll hurt yourself or be hurt by them, one or the other. But I realized right quickly she wasn't open to much of a Bible study. And she immediately told me that I had a devil. I wanted to tell her that probably there were a lot of my brethren that might really think that too, but they didn't have a way to figure out that I had one. They just knew it. But uh, nevertheless, I said, oh, I have a devil. You mean like the people that were devil-possessed in the New Testament? Yes, you have a devil. I said, and you're telling me you have the baptismal measure of the Holy Spirit like the Apostle Paul and Peter and the other apostles? Yes. I said, in other words, you have the power to cast out the devil? Yes, I do. I said, you better cast him out of me because that's your responsibility. If you don't, God's going to require it of you on the day of judgment. Conversation ended. That's the way you deal with people who are simply unreasonable. Else, just don't deal with them at all. Let me ask you this. Do you consider yourself an honest-hearted, reasonable person? Okay. Then think about these things. And you young people, you better, as my grandmother used to say, put this in your pipe and smoke it. And that's long before it meant what it's meant the last few years. That meant you take it in, you digest it, because it won't be like a young preacher who came to me when I was over at Southwest. He got married. They were gone for a few days on the honeymoon. I was sitting in the office. The door gets knocked on. I hardly have time to amen. The door flies open. Have you ever seen these, how you sew in a comic strip? A person is angry and he's got a scowl. He sort of, they sort of draw lines across the... That's the way he looked and he came through the door. He said, how do I get out of this? I said, you don't. That's exactly the way I answered him. I said, you don't. Well, you can't get out of things except the way we studied it today. Enter into a marriage with the determination that you will be with it for life. As far as your part is concerned, you're going to do God's will. And you better into a enter into a marriage with somebody else who has the same disposition toward God and the authority of His Word also. That's just the way that's right and can not be wrong. If you're not a Christian, become one this afternoon. We've studied what it takes. As a child of God, if you've sinned, repent of it, confess those sins, and pray to God for forgiveness. He wants to forgive you, but you must be willing to submit to his will. If you're subject to the Lord's invitation, we invite you to come while we stand and while we sit.